Hello and welcome to Sterling Gamer with me, Sterling, and welcome to a very new type of video. One where instead of just playing a game, I talk about it. It's gonna be super fun, I cannot wait. Today we're gonna be talking about... Uh, no, I have a very good game. Uh, nope. Uh, no. Super Mario Brothers! Super Mario Brothers, yes. Yes. Nailed it. Super. Super Mario Brothers is one of the best-selling games ever made, and it spawned an entire franchise with tons of sequels, reboots, and spin-offs of all types. Like, did anyone on the original development staff for the game ever think Mario and Bowser would be casually playing golf together one day? I've never actually played the game all the way through. I've always wanted to, but I've never done it, so I guess I might as well go try. Well, that was interesting. The game has aged pretty poorly. This video is gonna be terrible. I have to talk about a game that has aged pretty poorly for quite some time. Ah, oh, I wanted this to be a good video. Come on, here's an idea. Here is an idea. Pull up your nearest history book, and let's go through the history of Super Mario Brothers. So hopefully we can fully appreciate the game. Nintendo was created on September 23rd, 1889, and made playing card games for years. They actually did cards for more years than they have done anything else combined. They later experimented with some other things in the 50s and 60s, but they really struck gold in the 70s, when they got into the video game business with their arcade systems and the Game & Watch line. They're doing quite well in Japan, with games like Wild Gunman, Sheriff, and Radar Scope. They really wanted to push Radar Scope in America, because they thought it would appear to us Westerners. Being just another Space Invaders type game, it did not do well, leaving Nintendo with a lot of unsold cabinets. Now let's picture you are Nintendo. What would you do? If you just messed up big time, lost a lot of money, and were nearly unknown in your target country. If you said, make the biggest video game franchise of all time, you would be correct. To do it, Nintendo looked to a kid just out of college named Shigeru Miyamoto. For those who don't know who he is, he made this, and this, and this, and these but none of them came close to his first two video game characters. Instead of starting with some gameplay ideas like most developers would, Shigeru Miyamoto started with a story. One where a carpenter kept a pet gorilla. Of course, it escaped, took the carpenter's girlfriend, and climbed up a building that was being constructed. The ape was named Donkey Kong. The girl was named Pauline, and the carpenter was named Jumpman. The reason for this was Miyamoto called this new type of game an athletic game, and thus needed an energetic protagonist. Hey, I could be an energetic protagonist. It was also kept vague to allow the player to picture themselves as the hero. The old radar scope systems were repurposed for this new game called Donkey Kong. This guy, he was successful, but not only that, he was their biggest success yet. This is exactly what the Americans wanted, and the Japanese loved it too. Miyamoto immediately started making a sequel, and then a spin-off, all about Jumpman. And this was where Mario was born. The sequel to Donkey Kong is nothing special, it's just Donkey Kong Jr. It too has a story where Jumpman another Jumpman, have captured DK, leaving a son, who is the modern Donkey Kong, to save him. This marks the one and only time that Mario is ever a villain in a game. I did say Mario, because the next game that Miyamoto made was all about Jumpman, who he renamed Mario. Some other changes were made, like his job switching from carpenter to plumber, and him being Italian. 
Mario Brothers was all about Mario and his brother Luigi in New York with pipes, turtles, and crabs. Yeah, this one does not have a story, or a canonical reason for existing for that matter. But by now, that's normal for Mario. All three of these games were extremely popular. They even made a third DK game. But Nintendo was slowing down arcade game creation because something much bigger was looming over the corner. The same exact year that Donkey Kong Jr. and Mario Bros. released, the great video game crash happened. You see, alongside arcades, there were home consoles. The main company who made these was Atari. They made lots of games, to a fault. There was no quality filter on what went out, meaning a load of garbage games were flooding the market until Atari ended it all with E.T. They hyped this game up. It was the first major movie tie-in game, and it flopped hard. It was one of, if not the, worst game ever made. Seriously, this is supposed to be this? No, 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 no. No one wanted any home console games at the time, especially in America. Nintendo wanted to change this, but they needed to be stealthy about it. The history of the NES could be its own video, but I'll try to keep it brief. Nintendo marketed the system as a toy, even including some toy-like add-ons to try to appeal to parents. It was officially called the Nintendo Entertainment System over here in America, and released on October 18, 1986. The Japanese were more open to the idea of home video games, so it was not hidden at all what the system was over there. It was called the Famicom, or the Family Computer, and released on July 15, 1983. Because of the super long wait us Americans had to endure, we got some stellar launch titles, such as Super Mario Bros. It was typically bundled in with the game Duck Hunt, like the cartridge that I have here, but it did have a standalone release and a three-in-one where it had Super Mario Bros, Duck Hunt, and a game called World Class Track Meet. Before we dig into Super Mario Bros, it would only be fair to talk about its siblings first. I don't have a CRT. Yeah, Duck Hunt requires the NES Zapper, which is one of the toy-like peripherals but it requires a CRT, and new TVs won't work with it. So I've never been able to actually play Duck Hunt. And World Class Track Meet seems boring. I guess there's no more distractions. It's time to talk about Super Mario Bros. The game takes the concept of the original Donkey Kong being an athletic game, and really brings that term into its modern name, which is platforming. Super Mario Bros. practically invented the genre, and really showed off side-scrolling. Most games up until this point were single screens, and the ones that did attempt scrolling were... Not great, to say the least. To be fair, Ice Climbers, which was another NES launch title, also showed off scrolling, but not to the extent of Mario. The game would not be the same without scrolling, and really pushed it to its limits at the time. The concept of the game is pretty simple. Eight worlds, with four levels each. Simply run to the right, hit a flagpole at the end, and move on to the next stage. The fourth level in each world is a castle, ending in a fight with Bowser. Although worlds 1 through 7 are enemies disguised as Bowser, revealed as themselves if killed by fireballs. Now, to circle back to the beginning of this video, I said that the game did not age well at all. But you know, I like stalling and suspense, so we're gonna look at the positives first. Music. My goodness, this game has some good music. The game only has six music tracks, but each one is instantly recognizable and memorable. This game sets the groundwork for the amazing music the series would later bring. Yes, if I wanted to listen to every song in the game, it would only take me around 10 minutes, but those would be an enjoyable 10 minutes. I guess we could talk about the art. 
I love how everything looks, and how the developers push the limits of the NES. The art all blends together very well, and is super recognizable, maybe more so than the music. And it still looks good, and is used to this day. The item system was revolutionary at the time. No games had really done items before. There is the mushroom, making you taller and able to take another hit of damage. The flower is identical to the mushroom in this game, but it changes your color and lets you shoot projectiles at enemies. There are 1-up mushrooms that give you extra lives, and stars that grant you temporary invincibility to all enemies. Alright, Malachi, this on you. Go, go, go! Superstar Malachi! Speaking of which, the enemies are pretty cool. As mentioned, there's Bowser, and his fake Bowser has bosses, but there are also Koopa Troopas. Simple turtles that move based on their shells, green falling off ledges, and red staying on. When jumped on, they go into their shells to hide, which can then be kicked to take out other enemies. There are Buzzy Beetles, which are essentially reskinned red Koopa Troopas. And there are Hammer Bros. They are the worst! There are quite a few more enemies, but the last one I want to highlight are Goombas. They were added very late in development, and are the simplest enemies in the game. Simply one frame that flips after you and can be killed in one hop. If you beat the game, you can play it again with some slight edits. Most notably, all Goombas are replaced with Buzzy Beetles. Uh, what else is there to talk about? Uh, the story's pretty great. The instructional booklet for the game includes a story, and it's better than some modern Mario stories. One day, the kingdom of the peaceful mushroom people was invaded by the Koopa. So far, so good. A tribe of turtles famous for their black magic. So far, so good. The quiet, peace-loving mushroom people were turned into mere stones, bricks, and even field horsehair plants. Not horsehair plants. And the Mushroom Kingdom fell into ruin. But wait, there's more. The only one who can undo the magic spell on the Mushroom People and return them to their normal selves is the Princess Toadstool, the daughter of the Mushroom King. Unfortunately, she is presently held in the hands of the great Koopa Turtle King. Koopa Turtle King. I love it. Mario, the hero of the story, maybe, hears about the Mushroom People's plight and sets out on a quest to free the Mushroom Princess from the evil Koopa and restore the fallen kingdom of the Mushroom People. It's almost done, I promise. It also says, you are Mario. I am? It's up to you to save the Mushroom People from the black magic of the Koopa. I don't know, that sounds like... Like the Ninja Turtles. I don't know, it gives me Ninja Turtle vibes. The Koopa! There is a lot to unpack here. First off, the Koopa of Black Magic? Like, the only Magic Koopa we ever see is Magic Koopa. The Magic Koopa, and well, all led by Kamek. But I'd hardly count that as being famous for magic. Second, some of the toads turn into bricks. You all know what Mario destroys throughout the entire game. This guy's a murderer. Third, there's a Mushroom King? Where is he? Finally, sort of a two-in-one. It states that Mario is not from the Mushroom Kingdom. He hears of the kingdom's plight and goes on a quest to go help him. Also, the bonus thing, though, is that it says he's maybe the hero. Why? The story of this game is just so odd compared to all the other games in the series. Okay, what else can we do? Say? Nothing. It's time to talk about the bad stuff. You see, there is a lot wrong with this game. But I don't like saying it because I don't want to disrespect the game at all. But I have no choice. This is what I don't like about Super Mario Bros. The multiplayer stinks. 
Super Mario Bros. 3 at least let the players affect each other and compete in any way other than just speedrunning. This game's multiplayer is just endurance and waiting for the other player to finish. The controls don't feel good. They're way too slippery and glitchy. Multiple times I glitched on a block and it really breaks the pace of the game. As if there is any! The game allows you to move very fast, but it's unnecessarily hard to do so and sometimes is nearly impossible, but other times it is nearly required. Also, the theming is not good at all. There are only four level themes in the game. Ground, underground, water, and castle. Sometimes there is ground with a black background, but I would hardly count that as a theme. It is understandable that this game would be short, but it is crazy short. It took me 30 minutes to beat on my first time. Items are just buggy in general. It's not like modern games where picking up a fire flower gives you fire, Mario. No, it just puts you up one stage. So if you're a small Mario and you pick up a flower, you just become Super Mario. The item stop all momentum when running or jumping, even if you hold any movement button. I don't know if it was just the ROM that I was using, but when any sound plays, the music bugs out. Take a listen. The final problem that I have with the game is this one random cloud corner that I found. I forgot what level it's in, but the level will probably be on screen right now. Look at this! This is why IGN only gave Super Mario Bros. a 9 out of 10. All jokes aside, this game did incredibly and saved the gaming world as a whole. We wouldn't have the Switch or the PlayStation or the garbage Xbox consoles if it wasn't for this little game. This game definitely does not hold up well today, but I personally think it's about the journey and not the destination. It's still a bad game. I hope you all enjoy my first video in this style. I really want to make this a whole series, just like Mario had. So I'll just follow in its footsteps. I guess I gotta go and ruin this video's sequel.